Today's New Testament scripture comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 4, 30, verse 35 through 41. Looking at the picture that uh, Russell has displayed behind me, let me just ask if any of you know what's going on in that picture. <laughs> I think you probably do, all of you. Now, <clears throat> Earlier in this particular chapter of Matthew, Jesus used parables to explain the mystery of God's kingdom, including the parable of the sower, the lamp on a stand, and the parable of the mustard seed. This is a beautiful part of Matthew where Jesus is teaching. And through all these teachings, he's speaking to enormous crowds on the shores of the Sea of Galilee where, while privately revealing deeper meanings to his disciples. The disciples are witnessing his growing popularity and the power in his teachings are probably filled with awe and perhaps some apprehension about what lies ahead in tagging along behind such a remarkable leader. As evening pro approaches, Jesus instructs his disciples to cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, perhaps to rest, perhaps to escape the throngs. Now the Sea of Galilee is known for its sudden and its fierce storms due to its low-lying location and surrounding hills. And it serves as a setting for a profound revelation of Jesus' identity. While they're on the water crossing the sea, a fierce storm erupts, battering the boat and instilling fear in the disciples. What is Jesus doing, however? Y'all know. He was asleep on a cushion in the stern, resting peacefully amidst the chaos. And in this moment of fear, these ordinary men, his disciples, wake him with a question, a panic teacher don't you care if we drown? Well, their plea reveals both their fear and their limited understanding of who Jesus is. They know he is not like them. He is extraordinary. But they cannot yet grasp the full extent of his power and his authority. Jesus rises and rebukes the wind and the waves with a simple command, Quiet, be still. And instantly the sea calms leaving the disciples in utter awe. And in this act, Jesus demonstrates not only his authority over creation, but also his divine nature, a profound revelation for his followers. Now, the New International Version, which I like to read, emphasizes the humanity of the disciples, their vulnerability, their doubts, their fears, as they witness Jesus' command over the natural world and through their fear, we see our own struggles with faith in moments of chaos. Jesus' response to them, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? Challenges us to trust in his presence and his power, even when we feel overwhelmed. This passage invites believers to see Jesus as both fully present in human struggles and infinitely powerful, able to calm any storm with a word. And now let us hear the word. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet. Be still. And then the wind died down, and it became completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Thus ends the reading of the gospel. May we be blessed by its meaning. 
have props. Props. Raise your hand if you own a Bible. Keep it raised if you have two Bibles. Keep it raised if you have three, four. <laughs> That's what I thought. I love Bibles. Not just any old Bible. Well, but all Bibles. It can be a little challenging to get through the King James Version, which this church gifted me and is sitting over there on the lectern, but I still love it. And I go to the King James Version for certain, certain things that just must be said in the old language. I, I like holding them, leafing through them, keeping them close so I can pick them up for a quick read. This is my old red Bible from when I was confirmed. It's, hold, it's held up pretty well for all these years, you know. It was in the 1970s when it was given to me, so... Now, recently I inherited a few Bibles I'd been hoping for, my grandmother's, my grandfather's. Where are they? They're here, too. Here they are. My grandfather was a Methodist missionary. This was his Bible upon his confirmation. And this was my grandmother's, his wife. And when he died of tuberculosis, she took over his ministry briefly. In Bloomington, by the way. In Illinois, in Bloomington. She was my love. That woman. When you come from a family of preachers like I did, it's almost amusing how many Bibles are floating about. I did try to count them last night, and I stopped at 15, and I know there are others somewhere, and I'm sure that many of you are like me that way. But each Bible is a treasure because they're all a little bit different. It's not like owning 10 copies of any other book, is it? Now, my favorite Bible is the red one, which I showed you. I received it for confirmation as a teenager. It's all marked up. The pages are turned inside and out. It's pressed many a rose in its day. And I hope upon my death that my children recognize the value of that book. Hmm? About 10 years ago, I found another Bible. I, even before that, I found one one day when I was a reporter uh, I was doing a story and I, I, I saw an abandoned church and I walked into this abandoned church feeling even then the sense of God's presence and as I looked around to see what had become of this abandoned church I found a Bible on the floor upside down and open and just laying there and, and I was kind of horrified by the disregard so I picked it up and set it right but, but about 10 years ago I found this Bible it's an old one from 1929. It's called the New Analytical Bible. And I found it where I worked at Pinecrest Community up in Mount Morris. It was actually lost. Um, no one would claim it. And after nobody claimed it, I found it um, falling down behind a piano when we moved the piano for some new carpet. And knowing me as you do, I, I tried to become its owner. And... As you can see, I did. We did ask around. Um, there are things written in here that seem to have been clues, but nobody claimed it, so it became mine. And uh, when I first thumbed through it, I was in a time in the Christian church called Ordinary Time. Maybe you've heard of that, and we're kind of there right now, which roughly is a time in the Christian calendar when we're not celebrating Easter or Christmas or preparing for them or in their aftermath of Pentecost, Lent, or Advent. That's all you really need to know. Ordinary Time is the time when really nothing is going on a whole lot. And when I found this Bible, I would have to say it was also early in my journey as a minister. I was pretty much a, a rookie. I was a lay pastor. And during that time, I attended the funeral of a man we all loved in Mount Morris. He lived in the retirement community where I worked at the time, at Pinecrest. And that's when I met Bob. His name was William, but everybody called him Ole. Ole was a gentleman always a pleasure to meet in the hall. At his funeral, I listened to the speaker describe Ole, and I thought, Mount Morris has really lost a great soul. And afterward, I complimented the speaker, saying the town had lost a wonderful person. 
And another man standing beside me agreed, turning to me and saying he never said a harsh word about anyone. He minded his tongue, and he was an incredible listener. And when you know men like Oli, it almost makes you ashamed that you aren't as good a person as that guy was. And then he added, Oli was just an ordinary guy. And that comment, Oli was just an ordinary guy, got me thinking about ordinary people called to be God's servants on earth. People like you, and you, and you, and me. The Bible is filled with stories of ordinary men and women chosen by God. Abraham, Moses, Job, Caleb, and Mary, a woman of humble birth, chosen to be the mother of the king of kings, who himself walked among us, seeming to others, particularly most of the Jewish and Roman rulers of the time, as an ordinary man. As time went on, his followers would come to know that this that that designation was not only false, it was just the opposite. For as we would all learn slowly like his disciples did on the boat that day, Jesus was an extraordinary man. He was the Son of God. Now, as I held that old analytical Bible in my hands when it became mine, I realized it was time to prepare a sermon on the impact of those who appear like ordinary people, which ultimately led me to the book of Mark chapter 4 that we had in our scripture today. Now this scripture comes from when Christ preached in Galilee and traveled with his disciples across that sea of Galilee, and in that fierce storm they watched him calm the wind and the waves, which prompted that question, who is this man? Who is this man that commands even the wind and the sea? Mark recounts miracle after miracle leaving the disciples in constant astonishment. And I know I referenced Matthew earlier when I talked about all of the parables of Jesus and they're reflected in all the, in all the synoptic gospels. Now moments later I stumbled upon a similar online commentary as I was, as I was working with this new Bible on the topic of Jesus as an ordinary man. And I began to read through it to see what it had to say. And as I was reading, I paused and I decided to open the analytical Bible, you know, this lost one that I had inherited in Mount Morris, to read Mark chapter 4. And what happened then was itself extraordinary. I noticed a purple ribbon. Maybe you can see it sticking out of the top there. I noticed a purple ribbon marking a spot in this Bible which I had just inherited, and it had been in that place in the Bible for so long it left an indentation. Pages were curled around it. So out of curiosity, I opened it up to that spot, and it was the exact page and the exact scripture referenced in the commentary I had been reading five minutes before online. This was synchronicity, serendipity, the simultaneous occurrence of events which appear significantly related but have no discernible cause for connection. How did that happen? How could I be reading about it five minutes and then open it up to the very page? Serendipitous, occurring or discovered by chance in a happy or beneficial way, an amazing coincidence. Well, this was extraordinary to me. I paused and I rubbed my chin. When coincidences like that happen, I'm always astounded, much like Christ's apostles were when they watched him calm the storm. I was looking for that scripture. And someone years before had marked it with a purple ribbon. And nobody had claimed that book. So it was meant to be mine, wasn't it? On that ribbon was the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you don't see much in that, but I do. I believe these moments are extraordinary when they happen. So I knew I was meant to read Mark 4 and write this sermon. Now here's what I want to tell you. We don't have to perform miracles like Christ did. We don't have to calm seas or cure diseases. As ordinary people, in ordinary times, we're called to be polite. To be giving, to be kind and thoughtful. 
This is how we can be extraordinary, like my friend Oli, and as Christ calls us to be. There was a time when some women grouped together in the city of Sterling handed out signs. I have no doubt Cena saw them because she's nodding her head, and I wore one in my yard until it became dilapidated. And what did that sign say? Do you remember? Be kind. That's all the sign said. Be kind. And I put it in my yard and Bob mowed around it for years. Now it sits in my garage because it's tattered. Be kind. Consider the storms in your life. Those situations that challenge you when you find yourself getting all worked up. And remember that becoming an extraordinary human being means holding to faith in Christ and his lessons. The Bible reminds us we will face trials. James in his letter writes this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And James also teaches that everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. He warns of the dangers of careless words, saying, The tongue is a fire, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse men made in the likeness of God. For James, even watching what we say can be an extraordinary act, one any of us can achieve. Sometimes our expectations of ourselves, of others, of our spouses, our children, they're unrealistic of our pastors. We might wonder, what will people say about me after I am gone? How will I be remembered? Will people say I was an extraordinary person in my caring, my kindness, my giving and my love for others. I pray we all have faith that God will give us the strength to be extraordinary people in these ordinary times. God wants to provide answers beyond what we can imagine. So if you're discouraged, trust that God hears you. Perhaps now you're on the sidelines watching others serve in Christ's name. Even so, your gifts of kindness and thoughtfulness are still within you because you were made in his image. Christ promises his presence and support in whatever we do, helping us overcome the fears and the challenges that strike us and sometimes hold us back from being extraordinary people. So much good goes undone because of fears and sadness that burden so many of us. And yet, often, people just need a friend. They just need someone to listen to them. They need to talk or spend time. When Oli was in his last days, I wanted to listen to him. I visited him in his nursing home, which was down the hall and around the corner at Pinecrest. He had taken almost nothing from his apartment, just a few clothes, a magazine, and his Bible. His new room in the nursing home was stark, practically barren. I asked him as I sat beside him if he wanted anything else from his apartment. And he just smiled, saying he had everything he needed. Those of us who knew Oli will never forget his kindness and his good works for as long as we live. In the movie My Fair Lady, Professor Henry Higgins sings about being an ordinary man who wants nothing more than an ordinary chance. But he also added to live exactly as he likes and do precisely what he wants. I get his desire to be average independent of the responsibilities that we all have. But I'm not positive that doing exactly what we want is what God has in mind for us ordinary folks. I think Oli had the best approach. 
making an ordinary self into an extraordinary Christian. For it is clear to me that in his wisdom, God uses ordinary people, people like us, for work in his kingdom. We're like the mustard seed, the parable which also lives in Mark With what can we compare the kingdom of God? It is like a grain of mustard, the smallest of all seeds. Yet when it is sown, it grows to be the greatest of all shrubs, so that the birds of the air can make their nests in its shade. The ordinary becomes extraordinary when it is mixed with the love of Christ. Go then. Be like that mustard seed. Be small, be ordinary, but plant your heart in the soil of good intentions so you may grow to be like Christ, doing good, being kind, and minding your words. Let us all be as ordinary as Oli. Maranatha, my friends. Amen. And let us pray. Lord, we know we don't need to be kings or movie stars or superstars to do your good work on earth. Help us to remember this in our day-to-day lives as we encounter others. Help us to listen more than talk, guide more than criticize, smile more than frown, and give more than take. Forgive us our uncertain faith, our refusal to forgive, our wavering compassion, our exaltation of the proud and powerful. Only you know when the weak need us in their lives to show kindness and lend a helping hand or an open ear. Help us to refrain from gossip and the spreading of ill will. Bless us this day and each day as we go about your ways, praising your name and remembering the lesson of Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And please